Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to welcome you to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Professional Webinar Series for 2023. Um, we've got about another minute before we get started. We'll start right at 10 o'clock. Um, I just wanted to welcome you all here. Um, and if you um, would be so kind as to maybe put in what county you're from in the chat box, um, we would love to hear from you. Also, you could put in maybe if you're having a particular problem in the landscape with a pest or a plant, that might be something that would be interesting to talk about later in the, in the presentation. Um, like I said, we'll start right at 10 o'clock, so we have just another minute before we get started. Yep. It looks like it is 10 o'clock now, so I would like to once again welcome everybody to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Professional Webinar Series. My name is Claire Lewis. I'm the Florida Friendly Communities Coordinator for this state. Um, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, which is um, which plants are eating your plants, which pests are eating your plants, and key plant, key pests. This webinar will provide a brief overview of the biology and identification of key insect pests and review the recent emerging key insect pest management strategies. Um, this webinar is approved for one FNGLA and one FFLCP um, CEU. Um, there's a $10 administration fee to receive this certificate of continuing education. Um, and I will put a link in the chat box to make payment for the certificate if you have not already done so, and you will receive that by Friday. Um, we'll submit the CEUs to the licensing agency tomorrow, so make sure if you do want that CEU to make payments by the end of the day. And this is um, part of a monthly webinar series held on the second Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. Our next webinar will be New Year, New Plants, Learn About New Plant Releases with Dr. John Butemuller. Um, you may have noticed your microphones have been muted, so please put your questions into the chat box and we'll take them at the end of the presentation. And also you'll see a survey invitation pop up if you can please take a moment to fill this out. That would be great. Um, Tom Wickman is today's speaker and I will go ahead and introduce him. He is a self-proclaimed plant nerd who has been in the horticulture industry for over 48 years. He's currently the assistant um, statewide coordinator, um, the assistant director for Florida Friendly Landscaping Program and the statewide coordinator for the Green Industries Best Management Practices Program. This program teaches green industry professionals environmentally safe landscaping practices that help conserve and protect Florida's ground and surface waters, as well as natural resources. Tom is also the uh, radio host for the Florida Friendly Landscaping in a Minute radio show, which airs in 19 counties in Northeast Florida. Tom and the FFL team are currently working on the production of season three of the television show, Flip My Florida Yard. Season two is currently airing on PBS stations statewide and season one shows can be found on the Discover Florida channel. When he's not working, Tom works in the landscape with his wife, Becky. Tom, Becky, and his daughter, Megan, are big Gator fans and enjoy following many different Gator sports throughout the year. And with that, I will turn the, um, the microphone over to Tom and uh, enjoy the webinar. Claire, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm so excited today to, to be presenting to the group um, on a topic that uh, I'm very passionate about, um, key plants, key pests. Um, Let's see, and for some reason, my slides are not advancing. There we go. Just wanted to back up just a little bit, give you a little background, talk a little bit about Florida Friendly Landscaping, what it is. It's, it's an integrated approach to maintaining an attractive, colorful, and diverse yard. Um, you know, and the whole purpose is to provide science-based, environmentally friendly landscape practice information to folks on how to design and maintain those landscapes. And that way we can help protect our natural resources. So important that people understand this. And it, it doesn't have to look any particular way. It can look many different ways. 
um, and it, it suits any landscape, um, you know, it really goes into that design and, and management. That management is a big piece of what a Florida-friendly landscape is about. The goals of the program are certainly to conserve water, reduce water pollution, uh, preserve our natural resource, and, and enhance Floridians' lives. And there are nine core principles of the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is probably the, the most important one we'll talk about a lot today is right plant, right place. But there's water efficiently, fertilize appropriately, mulch, attract wildlife, manage yard pests responsibly. We'll talk a lot about that today as well. Recycle, prevent stormwater runoff, and protect the waterfront. Now, do realize that all of these nine core principles interact with each other and do affect uh, you know, the overall health of the plant. And you'll find, I mentioned this a lot during the presentation today, is you know, healthy plants are going to uh, survive pest issues uh, more so than, than you know, stressed or weakened plants. And so you'll, you'll get that a lot today. Part of right plant, right place is all about uh, you know, making sure we're selecting the best plant for that location. And that takes into account you know, lighting, soils, uh, moisture levels, um, just making sure, you know, pH, you know, making sure we have the, the, that right location for that plant so that when it goes in there, the stress level will be as low as possible. And when we're talking about that number six, manage yard pests responsibly, we do like to practice IPM or integrated pest management. So we take into account that, you know, pesticides are on the table and they may be a viable way to manage a particular pest, but they're not our first go-to. You know, the, our first thing is going to be really identifying what that problem is and then seeing if there's some uh, some strat some management strategies that can help uh, eliminate that pest. Maybe it's just you know the the old uh, pluck and squish technique um, or you know just mechanical removal. Um, that that can work in many cases. Um, but certainly pesticides may uh, move up into this category. And when we're talking about key plants and key pests, it's so important that you, when you're choosing plants for your landscape, that you know the pests associated with those. And the reason why this is so important is because if you know what to, uh, what pests to expect on uh, whatever plant it may be, then you know how to scout it better and you know what to watch for. Um, and, and hopefully that uh, the presentation today will give you kind of a, a heads up as to what to look for. Um, you know, I've had to shorten this up a little bit. It could have been a three to four hour presentation. I know you're not game for sitting here that long and my voice probably wouldn't hold out that long. Uh, but, you know, we, we'll keep this within the, the hour, but we'll go through quite a few plants and, and quite a few pest problems um, so that uh, you get the idea of what to look for uh, on some of these uh, common Florida landscape plants. So let's get right into it. Um, we'll talk first about azaleas. Uh, you know, county agents get probably more azaleas than any other um, landscape plant brought into them other than uh, turf grass. Um, it's, you know, and it's not necessarily an easy diagnosis because oftentimes it can be a complex of problems that, uh, that kills people's azaleas. Here you can see a, a list of various insects, various diseases, a, a little longer list of diseases than the insects, and uh, even then some, uh, some other problems that uh, uh, might show up as well. So a lot of problems with azaleas. Um, not to say they can't be Florida friendly, but we need to make sure we're watching out for, uh, for those various problems. We'll start first with the Azalea caterpillar, also known as the Azalea defoliator caterpillar. Um, this is a caterpillar that can get up to about two inches long. Um, it does have, you know, a, a red head. Um, when these are, are first laid, uh, when the eggs are laid on uh, one particular um, uh, branch of the azaleas, you'll find that they all hatch out and they all congregate together. And if you just monitor and scout your landscape, 
um, on a regular basis, you can look across the, the top of an of azalea plant and see, oh, okay, I, I see a brown, I see, you know, one particular lead is brown. And if you go and look, you'll probably see that it's just being chewed up by lots of tiny little, little caterpillars, and they'll all be um, on one little twig. So you'll be able to just clip that off, um, put it, uh, uh, and dispose of it, and you've eliminated the need, need to spray for anything. So um, that's, that's a quick and easy way, but um, you'll see lots of these probably late summer to early fall is the key time you'll see them. The key management strategy for controlling these is, again, to remove and destroy those infested branches. Uh, if it gets past that and you can't just do that, then you can certainly use some of the non-toxic pesticides first, um, things like BT, um, but there are certainly other pesticides recommended for caterpillar use uh, that you could always step up and use. Uh, just make sure you're following label instructions. The label instructions uh, are the law. Um, but uh, we will always try and use those non-chemical controls first. The next one you'll see on azaleas is azalea lace bug. And here you'll see these this kind of um, silvery, we'll call it stippled look uh, to the tops of the leaves. Um, it's probably going to be worse in full sun, um, you know, full sun locations more so than, than the shadier locations. And if you turn the leaves over, you'll see the, the lace bugs and they do have these uh, lacy wings and you'll see some of the egg masses and, and some of the, the frass left behind um, as those shiny black pellets. Um, the, uh, the nymphs will be crawling and, and have spines and they won't have their wings. This is used to be primarily a cool season pest, but you, you will see it at other times of the year. Um, and so this is, this is a pest that can do significant damage and, and make your azaleas look, uh, you know, unacceptable. So if you do have to treat for this, certainly, um, first thing I would do is monitor the population, see what kind of damage. We don't have to have perfection in our landscape. We can tolerate a little bit of damage. But once you've assessed that the damage is not acceptable, then there so, are some insecticides that you'll need to, uh, that you can and, and uh, control this with. He is going to be making sure you're getting uh, treatment on the top and bottom sides of the leaves because these are typically located on the undersides of the leaves. Next pest we're going to talk about is the azalea leaf miner. And this is actually a small caterpillar. Um, and it's tunneling inside the, the leaf tissue between the top and bottom uh, sides of the leaves. And, you know, it starts uh, mining through that leaf until it gets about uh, half, halfway mature, and then it bursts out. And uh, then it goes to the tip and curls the tip of the leaf back. Um, and so you'll tend to see this uh, folding leaf tips and it continues to feed. Um, so you're going to see these in spring and summer. Um, so kind of look for uh, that kind of damage that you might see. And here you can see that curled leaf tip. Um, and if you peeled that back, you'd see that uh, small little caterpillar doing some feeding. Um, you can use systemic insecticides. That's probably going to be your most effective um, product to use. Uh, and I would target that when uh, when infestation is is at its worst, and you know you want to want to make sure you catch it as early as possible. Next one we'll talk about is the rhododendron gall midge, and this one is going to cause uh, leaf curling and you know distortion of new growth, really uh, causing that witch's broom or or dwarfed um, appearance, and it's all going to be clustered at the at the tips of the branches. Um, you're going to see that active in spring. Um, there can be several generations, um, but uh, that will vary from season to season. Uh, you can prune out the affected terminals um, and uh, apply insecticides. Targeting bud break uh, is, is the time. And so if you've had you know, serious problems uh, in past years, that may be uh, a year you, you want to target for um, making sure that you protect that uh, newly emerging growth. 
Spider mites. Um, spider mites can get on a wide range of plants, and azaleas certainly are uh, are no exception to the rule. Um, they'll tend to cause this again a stippled look as you're looking at the top of the foliage. You'll tend to see, you know, a kind of a white dotted appearance. Um, you're going to find the mite mites and and their cast skins and eggs and and wetting um, that you can see if you look with a hand lens, perhaps. Um, and oftentimes it'll be located on the undersides of the leaves unless infestations get heavy and then you'll see them on all sides. Um, warm and dry conditions favor the two-spotted mite. Um, you can see it pictured there on the right-hand side. And cool and moist conditions favor the southern red mite uh, identified by its bright red color. Um, one easy way to help identify whether you have mite problems or not is to take uh, one of those branches that you suspect might be uh, might have mites on it, and you can always tap it onto a blank white sheet of paper and see if the dots are moving. If there are larger dots, colored red and move moving very fast, those are probably uh, parasitic. Uh, mites and they're out there doing some good and helping to control an issue. So you want to make sure that you're managing that, looking out for those biological controls, those predatory mites. Uh, if you see a, if if your plant looks like the plant in this picture and you see that much webbing and uh, that many uh, mites active, um, you need to get on control immediately. Um, certainly soaps and oils can be used, and there's a wide range of miticides uh, that can be used again. Again, follow label instructions and uh, get good uh, coverage of the spray top and bottom sides of the leaves. Azalea galls, uh, moving out of the insect and insect-like pests and moving into uh, some of the other uh, disease-type issues, um, and we'll talk about that azalea gall. It can cause kind of white to green fleshy uh, growths on the leaves um, and even can take over the, the flower buds. And if it completely takes over, it can make that flower bud um, kind of hard and waxy. Um, typically gonna see this during the cool, wet spring weather is when you're gonna most, most often see this. Um, and for management, uh, you can remove the galls. Um, a lot of the leaves may drop. Um, and so you may want to remove the mulch in the fall um, if, if you have a severe problem um, or rake out any of those old fallen leaves and uh, even remove some of that mulch so that you have less inoculum uh, for that, uh, that cool weather that, uh, so you don't get uh, more issues with this continuing to develop. Another disease on azaleas is cercospora leaf spot. You're going to see these circular or angular uh, dark brown spots, um, and you know you can see some uh, chlorosis, and if it's heavy, you'll see some quite a bit of leaf drop. It's most prevalent in uh, summer and fall, and in hot, wet weather, and that's uh, that's when this is going to be most active. Um, ideally, if you can avoid as much overhead irrigation as possible, keep the leaves drier. That's that's helpful. There are fungicides, but again, you're gonna to need to cover top and bottom sides of the leaf surface. And then we'll talk about uh, mushroom root rot. Mushroom root rot is a root rot disease that tends to affect plants that are under stress or weakened plants. Uh, usually not, it often doesn't affect uh, healthy, vigorously growing plants, uh, but uh, you will tend to see a uh, a slowing of growth, um, a thinning of the canopy. Um, one easy way to identify this is to peel back the bark uh, near the base of the plant and you'll you'll see that white mycelial growth underneath the bark. And that is the disease organism. It's you're you're seeing part of the disease organism there. And if uh, if that's what you see, then it's uh, uh, unmistakable what what you've got. Uh, later on in life, you may see, clusters of mushrooms that could form. Uh, also, you can see that uh, this disease can be shared by uh, roots that are grafted together, um, and it can occur just about any time of the year. 
Unfortunately, we don't have any good management strategies other than to remove diseased plants um, and as many roots as possible. Um, ideally, we'd fumigate that soil. Uh, if that's not an option, then we can certainly uh, replace some of that soil in the area um, before putting in a young, vigorous plant. You may ne even need to consider uh, changing species. Um, uh, might that might be a strategy that uh, that you intend that uh, you'll utilize. Ovalenia petal blight. Uh, this is something no no person wants to see on their azaleas because it causes these brown water soaked areas on the petals, causing the entire flower to become brown and ugly and slimy, and um, it tends to hang on the plant. Um, and so it's. You know, it's it's occurring during the bloom time, um, so it's one of those things that will really shorten that uh, that color that uh, your azaleas are putting on. As far as what to do about it, ideally, if we can uh, clean up some of that, remove some of those brown uh, flowers that are still hanging on the plant, uh, rake that up from below the plant, and um, utilize mulch. Make sure you have a good mulch layer, and uh, that will hopefully reduce uh, activity next year. Fungicides really aren't practical, but they can be effective if they're applied weekly during the bloom season. Um, so it would reduce disease severity. It's not gonna completely eliminate it, uh, but uh, it is uh, a management strategy. And wet root rots. Um, you'll find you know small young plants that um, tend to not be growing very vigorously, tends to be more on younger plants than uh, on older plants. You'll see uh, poor color to the foliage. You'll see branch death. Um, if you were to take that plant and uh, pull it out, you're going to see that the roots are going to be dark and slimy and rotted, and the cortex of those roots are will strip right off. Um, it's triggered by excess soil moisture. Um, you'll see that could be from poor drainage, could be from overwatering, could be from being planted too deep. Um, azaleas tend to be very shallow rooted plants. So that's another contributing factor, certainly. Um, and then anything else that could stress that plant, full sun, high pH, a um, lot of things can stress these azaleas out. And as I mentioned earlier, it's usually when someone walks in with one of these small azalea plants um, that's totally dead, they'll bring it into the extension office and they'll say, what killed my azalea? You know, it's usually not one thing. It's often, you know, a whole uh, range of things. Uh, what can we do about some of these wet root rots? Well, ideally, if you can control what the problem is, so identify that problem, and then either reduce irrigation or provide some extra drainage um, or reduce those stresses, certainly that, that can help. Um, if it's diagnosed in early cases, we can certainly apply. There are some fungicides that uh, can uh, provide some uh, benefit, but oftentimes it's that plant is dead before we uh, tend to identify that. Another problem with azaleas is iron chlorosis. That's new leaves turning yellow, but the veins are, are staying green. You'll often see this associated with high pH soils. We know that azaleas are acid loving plants and um, where are you gonna have those high pH soils? Um, in many of our residential landscapes, certainly, but near concrete surfaces, uh, if there's concrete debris or if soils have been brought in, uh, that's why it's so important to have a pH test done. So get a baseline, know exactly what you're dealing with. Um, oftentimes you'll see this too with the uh, uh, compacted soils or uh, areas that have had a lot of root damage. So what do we do? Um, maybe we replace that plant with something else if it's a, a major soil problem. Um, perhaps we can adjust the pH, but it, it depends on, on your soil characteristics, how alkaline your soil is, um, as to whether that, that could be effective. Um, it's difficult to lower a high pH. Uh, it's much easier to raise uh, a low pH than it is to lower that high pH soil. Um, and uh, iron applications can certainly be beneficial as well. And planting depth. You've heard me say it again, um, that 
There are a lot of stresses. This is one of the major stresses. In, uh, in this image, you can see that this plant was a good probably three and a half, four inches too deep. Um, and what you start getting is some adventitious roots coming off of this stem, trying to get this poor plant uh, the oxygen that it needs. The, the majority of its root system is well below that soil, uh, tends to be less oxygen down there. So it's, uh, it's trying to survive, um, but uh, this is just a, a recipe for a short life uh, for this azalea. And uh, as I mentioned, it's usually a uh, a complex of problems, oftentimes planted too deep uh, in a high pH soil, in the sun, uh, with, you know, nutritional problems, various insects uh, affect it. It's uh, maybe not getting enough irrigation. And all of a sudden, you know, this poor plant uh, succumbs and it's difficult to say. It's just, it's usually not just one factor. It's oftentimes many of these factors uh, combined all together. As far as you know, mulching, mulch is a, a great beneficial product. It's one of our nine principles. It's important we utilize mulch. We wanna make sure to pull the mulch away from the stems of our plants uh, and make sure that uh, they're, they're not volcano mulch um, and uh, that'll cause certainly cause problems. So that's azaleas. <sighs> I, I didn't think we were ever gonna get through that one, but um, that's probably the longest one we'll talk about today. Um, we'll move on to crepe myrtle. Um, certainly one of those staples in our landscape provides lots of color, long, uh, long color. I, I can't think of what our summers, how boring our summers would be without uh, crepe myrtles in our landscape. Here you can see we've got a few insect pests and uh, we've got a disease we'll talk about as well. Um, sooty mold um, grows on the excrement of sucking insects. And uh, when you see sooty mold, this black coating on the leaves, it's a key indicator that you've got insect pests either on that plant or on something above. So, uh, you know, whenever you see sooty mold, it's like, okay, now I need to start looking for what's causing that, uh, what, what created that. Oftentimes, it may be the crepe myrtle aphid. It's a yellow pear-shaped uh, insect. It's got uh, these... Uh, two cornicles on its backside. You'll see them late spring through fall. Uh, this one is host specific, meaning the crepe myrtle aphid only feeds on crepe myrtles, doesn't move or feed on anything else in your landscape. So um, as long as it's not doing sig significant damage um, to your crepe myrtle, then you can accept whatever damage it's doing. Um, management may not be necessary, um, but uh, oftentimes it can be in uh, very heavy uh, populations and cause a lot of sooty mold growth. There are a lot of natural predators out there like ladybird beetles and uh, lacewings and, and others that will help manage these, learn to recognize uh, what our beneficials look like, like this immature ladybird beetle. Um, a lot of people would see this and have no idea what it is. And, you know, they'd say, I've got some sort of infestation. I need to control it. Uh, maybe not. Uh, there are also uh, parasitic wasps that will uh, parasitize these aphids, and you'll see a lot of uh, aphid mummies. Um, if you see a lot of aphid mummies um, on, uh, on the undersides of the leaves, maybe management isn't necessary. Maybe the, the beneficials are doing enough for you. If you have to control soaps, oils, and other insecticides are certainly effective. But, uh, you know, look for this, uh, watch for the city mold, and uh, watch for the small uh, aphids that can be very prevalent. Metallic beetles, these small bright blue metallic beetles uh, will cause some leaf notching, um, do a little bit of feeding, um, but in most cases, it's not going to be heavy enough to warrant any sort of management strategy. Um, I have seen situations where uh, the feeding was fairly heavy, um, uh, especially on young plants, um, and it seems certain uh, indica varieties tend to be a little more uh, susceptible than others. Maybe the, the beetles like those more than others. Uh, I, I don't know whether it's an every year problem on those, but uh, it could just be that that was uh, particularly heavy years. But watch out for it if feeding becomes heavy. Uh, 
you know, there on a young plant, we could do some treatment, but in those cases, the damage is, is, does not warrant any sort of control. Crepe myrtle bark scale. This is one that uh, has recently been found in the panhandle in Florida. Um, it's the only bark scale on crepe myrtle. Um, you'll find abundant sooty mold with this one. Uh, juveniles are, are small and pink, and you'll find clusters of small pink uh, eggs, eggs uh, in some of these as well. Tends to congregate mostly on the upper branches. Um, it really diminishes the uh, production of flowers and the vigor of the plant. Um, this is one that we haven't, it's through most of the southeast at this point in time and uh, west through Texas. Um, it's one I don't want in Florida, but it's just a matter of time. Uh, we want to make sure that, you know, to manage crepe myrtle bark scale that uh, we're preventing the spread as much as possible. Tends to be worse in shady areas rather than in full sun. Um, so it's maybe a, a slightly less vigorous plant, uh, less vigorous growth. Um, it can be helpful uh, before uh, chemical treatment to take a scrub brush um, and scrub the, the bark of some of this. You can reduce the amount of pest activity. Um, systemic products uh, applied as a drench in early summer are probably the, the best management strategy, but don't uh, apply during flowering and make sure you're following the label uh, to follow all bee protection recommendations. Um, so it's, uh, crepe myrtles tend to have a lot of bee activity and we, we don't want to injure uh, the, the bees that would normally be attracted to those flowers. So it's a, it's a problem you're probably not seeing yet, if you do see it, make sure that uh, you report it um, to uh, to either your local extension office or you know to um, uh, make sure that uh, you report it to uh, state agencies so that uh, we can make sure to track this and make sure that uh, we keep it. We we know where it is so that it, it's helpful. But prevention of spread, if you find it somewhere, try not to move a plant you know, very far so that uh, before it's reported. And uh, certainly if you find it, maybe the destruction of that uh, that tree may be the best case scenario. And one of the diseases we'll talk about is powdery mildew. Uh, powdery mildew is causes this white growth on the leaves. Uh, you'll see it on buds. You'll see it on new shoots. Um, can distort the growth. You see that in some of these leaves here in this image. Um, and, you know, cause those leaves to kind of curl. Um, you'll see it worse in cool, dry conditions, and it's going to be worse in shade rather than in sun because that uh, just, uh, uh, that foliage is a little more soft, a little more susceptible. Um, and so there are, the best case scenario for this to me would be to choose varieties that are resistant to powdery mildew. Um, University of Florida has some has a great publication on crepe myrtles, and we'll um, share with you the, you can find a, a nice chart in there and it'll let you know how susceptible to powdery mildew that particular uh, cultivar selection is. Uh, a lot of the hybrid types that are hybrids between Lagostromia foreii and Lagostromia indica will tend to have Indi Indian sounding names. Many of those are resistant to powdery mildew. Um, if, uh, if needed, you can apply fungicides. They are effective. Let's move over to hollies. These ilex species, you can see we have uh, a host of uh, problems that you can get uh, with hollies as well. Lots of things to look out for. We'll start first with the insects, and we'll talk about Florida wax scale. Um, this is a... Um, a Mature scales are kind of round and convex, and uh, they have a, a that characteristic shape. Immatures will be um, darker in color, and they'll have a white fringe. Uh, you will get sooty mold associated with Florida wax scale, um, and uh, you'll see chlorotic uh, spots on the on the leaves. They'll often be located on the undersides of the leaves. They can also be on the stems. 
Um, but uh, that's where you'll see that chlorotic spot on the leaves. And um, in heavy situations, you'll see them on the undersides, uh, mainly near the, the veins. Um, and then once heavy uh, feeding goes, you can see them on all over all surfaces of the leaves. So it could be active year round. Uh, make sure that uh, your crawlers are active in the spring. Uh, and so what you want to do is monitor those crawlers and their activity during uh, through the spring and into summer. Um, there's, you know, monitor your biological controls, you know, if they're see if uh, these have been parasitized by some of the parasitic wasps out there. Um, certainly uh, oils uh, work well, soaps can work against the crawlers. Um, and uh, there are certainly other insecticides and sy some systemic products that can work well on Florida wax scale, but uh, certainly can make a plant look ugly. T scale, you'll see this oftentimes on hollies. You'll also see it on camellias. Um, T scale, you know, you'll you see on this uh, leaf here on the left, you kind of see this yellowing that you might see. Um, and you turn the leaf over and you're going to see that all this white waxy threads uh, of, uh, of the T scale. So this is a tiny armored scale, it can be present year round. Uh, where you're gonna see this the worst and where you can often find this, look on the back side of a plant up against a house uh, where there isn't a whole lot of air movement. And that's where you're gonna tend to see it the worst, um, but uh, it could be active year round. Um, make sure that you're protecting our, our natural predators that are out there. Um, soaps uh, can be somewhat effective. Oils I like a little bit better. And then there's a systemic insecticides, certainly too. Cylindrocladium leaf spot. Uh, this is one that you'll see uh, especially on Ilex vomitoria, um, but uh, it'll cause these circular spots. You'll see a lot of leaf drops and even some twig dieback. Um, you'll also see this one on Ilex crenata. Ilex cornuta and Ilex opaca. You're going to see it in, in hot, wet conditions. So our nice summer, wet summers is when you're going to see this. It's spread by splashing water. So what do we do? We'll try and uh, adjust irrigation to keep the foliage as dry as possible. Obviously, you can't uh, prevent splashing from rain, but you can certainly prevent splashing from irrigation. Um, remove the fallen leaves as much as possible. Um, if you have a severely affected plant, uh, it's time to remove that plant. Um, there are fungicides that uh, can be helpful as well. Dieback, we see this a lot, uh, especially in Ilex vomitoria, uh, in Ilex shillings. You'll see just areas that um, turn brown and, and die. Um, it uh, could be caused by a wide range of various fungi that are out there. Uh, most of them are spread by splashing water. Um, it's worse on plants that are sheared. Um, so any injuries or any shearing that's been done on that causes a lot of entry points uh, for those fungal diseases. Um, and so that's, that's where you're going to see the worst uh, injury from those. So, you know, fungal signs may be apparent, um, could even be pink uh, in color, but oftentimes they you know, you won't be able to see any particular sign from, from that disease. So what you're going to do is prune out uh, any of the, the dead portions. Uh, if a large portion of the plant has died out, you can replace that plant. Or if it's just not uh, acceptable to, uh, to the eye after removing the, the dead portions, it may be time to replace that plant. Um, and then fungicides after pruning can uh, limit infections, certainly. Spheropsis gall, you'll get these swellings near the, the tips of the, the branches and, and twigs, um, and uh, it causes this witch's broom look. Um, and oftentimes you're going to see like in this area where the, the tips of the branches kind of uh, tip up or, or grow upwards and uh, cause that uh, distinctive growth habit, and it'll also cause many of those limbs to die back. Uh, it's most severe on uh, East Palatka and Savannah. That's kind of where we've seen uh, the worst infections. Uh, however, it can get on, uh, on other 
species and selections. Uh, so what are you going to do um, if you find that uh, you have, have it? Ideally, if you can prune well behind it, if you can prune, you know, six to six inches or so behind it, um, that'll be helpful. Sterilize your pruners uh, between cuts. Uh, that's at the very least, uh, sterilize your pruners between moving from plant to plant, but uh, between cuts is better. Um, fungicides after pruning can help, uh, perhaps. And then uh, severely infested plants may have to be removed. I've seen situations in this where uh, people were shearing their uh, their East Palat Cahalis, and you know they were they were using gas head shears with it and just spreading that uh, that disease. And you know it was nothing but one big witch's broom. It became uh, in in a fairly short period of time. So it is one of those things that we can manage. Uh, but uh, something to watch out for. And root knot nematodes. Nematodes are microscopic roundworms that uh, feed on the root system. Um, and uh, they'll, the root knot nematode will cause these uh, swollen nodules on the roots. And nematodes just make that, that root system much less effective, make that plant weak um, and, and certainly much less vigorous. Um, so, you know, the, the way to see it really is to uh, look at the roots. Um, you can also uh, take soil samples uh, and, and find out what the uh, nematode content may be. Uh, the university can test that for you. Um, but uh, what you have is just a plant that has a poor weakened root system. So what do we do? Well, we're going to provide adequate water and fertilizer because you have a plant with a weakened root system. So if you can uh, baby that plant along, you may be able to get it to, um, you know, improve uh, to a degree anyway and survive. Uh, maybe time to remove and replace plants and, and some of that soil. And maybe, uh, maybe we replace it with something that isn't as effective by root knot nematodes. Um, and then certainly, you know, fumigation is an option in certain situations. And we'll look at magnesium deficiency. Here you can see kind of that uh, distinct inverted V that you'll often see with magnesium deficiency uh, on many plants, on a wide range of plants. Uh, you'll tend to see that occurring on mature foliage. You're going to see it worst in low pH um, and in situations where you just have a lack of magnesium. In, in low pH, magnesium is tied up in the soil and just not available to the plant. So uh, even if it was there, uh, the plant can't access it. So what do we do? Well, we'll check the pH and we may need to apply you know, dolomite or another lime product to uh, raise the pH if that's, uh, that's the case. Um, or we can apply Epsom salts um, or um, magnesium containing fertilizers. Let's move on to Indian hawthorn uh, or Raphaelipus. Uh, this is a, a problem, uh, I shouldn't say it's a problem plant, but it's a plant that people often have problems with. Um, and we'll talk about two particular problems with this. Uh, first, we'll look at the insect problem, the Florida wax scale. We've talked a little bit about Florida wax scale uh, already. Uh, again, it's got that round convex shape um, and then the immatures uh, will be darker in color with that white fringe. Um, you'll find a lot of sooty mold associated with this, and you'll see the chlorotic spots on the leaves because initially you'll tend to see it on the undersides of the leaves and then uh, under heavy infestations moving to the top. Um, it's present year round. Again, just, uh, just as we talked about previously, um, crawlers are going to emerge in the spring, so you're going to monitor that uh, spring through summer. Um, and then uh, look for biological controls. Um, look, see if our uh, predators, our natural predators, are uh, doing some good. Um, and uh, then we've got soaps that are effective on the crawlers, oils, and then uh, other systemic type in insecticide products. And the disease that we're going to talk about with this one is Entomosporium leaf spot. It's a it's a big issue, uh, especially with plants that um, that are maybe shaded, 
plants that are overwatered, um, plants that uh, uh, tend to um, have overhead irrigation. Um, new growth is the most susceptible. Um, the temperatures at this one, it, it's the cooler temperatures when we tend to see it, it's 59 to 77. Um, and then uh, once it's um, the, the higher temperatures and high humidity tend to uh, cause uh, further growth of it. It does take about nine to 12 hours of leaf wetness. So again, the more you can keep the, the leaves dry, the better. Um, so we're gonna minimize that overhead irrigation, improve air circulation, maintain low fertility. So it tends to be worse when we have um, a plant that's being pushed with a lot of fertilizer. And then you're gonna rotate your systemic and your protectant type fungicides. Uh, there are a lot of new uh, selections of uh, Rephiolepis that tend to be a little more resistant to Entomosporium leaf spot. So I'd encourage you to search, search out when you're looking to plant Rephiolepis, search out some of those new cultivar selections and see if you can see what kind of success you have with those. Um, but uh, the, there's some, some varieties that uh, uh, I've seen out there that have are much more uh, prolific in the landscape and tend to have many fewer problems. But see if you can manage as many of those um, cultural situations as you can, uh, keeping those leaves as dry as possible. Let's move on to junipers. A uh, common plant uh, in the, the Florida landscape, certainly. Uh, tough and drought tolerant, loves the sun, loves the heat, uh, has a few insect problems and a few disease problems that we'll talk about. First one we'll talk about is spider mites. Um, and you'll tend to see that the, the foliage tends to look a little off color. Um, you, can, you can see them with a hand lens if you take a hand lens or you can always take that branch and uh, tap it onto a white sheet of paper and see whether you've got uh, some of those dots that are moving. The two spotted spider mites again are more active in the warm and dry times and the southern red mites more active in the cool and moist time. So there's just about no time that, uh, that you, you're out of the woods. And this one also can get the spruce mites in the winter time. Uh, for management, um, ideally, you know, hopefully our predatory mites are active and we're not doing anything to reduce their populations. So hopefully they'll help, help us control things. Soaps, oils, and miticides are available. You might also have webworms. Um, this, this is where you'll have individual branches uh, turn red and then eventually die. Um, what you've got is a small, uh, small little caterpillar uh, near the base of the plant. And uh, it's, it's actually gonna create some webbing in many cases that will kind of hold the foliage and the soil together down at the, the base of the plant. And it'll uh, girdle the bark uh, during the winter time. So it's, uh, uh, it's a real problem. Here you can see that where that bark has been girdled. Um, you're gonna see it worse on ground cover type. Um, that's, that's where you'll see it the worst, but other, uh, others that have branches all the way to the ground can also uh, be affected as well. Um, the girdling damage happens during the winter. You won't see the browning and dying probably until uh, well into spring. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna remove dead branches and uh, there are insecticides that uh, that can be applied, but really biggest thing is the the most important thing is to manage uh, to watch this one and look out for it. And mushroom root rot. We talked again about mushroom root rot, so I'll go quickly through this one. Um, again, slow decline of the plant. Um, this one you could see that white mycelial growth underneath the bark near the soil line, um, wide host range, um, and oftentimes. Again, it's associated with old weakened plants uh, and uh, oftentimes plants that are weakened from something else. Usually vigorous growing plants are not gonna be affected by mushroom root rot. Um, so what are you gonna do? You, you'll remove those diseased plants and roots, fumigate the soil before replanting or replace some of that soil or change uh, species. Let's uh, talk about another disease, Rhizoctonia web blight. Um, this will cause kind of random dead areas. You'll see both new and old growth. 
and you'll actually see thread-like mycelial growth that you could see with a hand lens. You'll see that in this next image, and you can kind of see that mycelial growth um, throughout. Uh, it is a soil-borne fungus spread um, by splashing water. You'll see it during the hot, wet times, so during our summers. So as much as you can, reducing overhead irrigation, um, hopefully improve air circulation as much as possible, and there are uh, fungicides that are approved for, for management. You'll see that uh, with tip light, um, you'll see this one uh, starts from uh, the tips, uh, from the newest growth, and uh, progresses backwards. Um, so they're going to kind of, those tips are going to turn grayish in color and eventually, you know, turn more ashy. Um, you'll find black, reproduc uh, black uh, reproductive structures that'll be visible with a hand lens. So it's a, a way to help uh, verify what you have. Um, young plants are the most often affected. Usually you don't see this on older plants. Um, other stresses can make it worse. Um, high humidity and cool temperatures um, are required for that spore germination. And then uh, you'll see well, those warm temperatures favor disease development. What are you going to do about it? Plants usually outgrow it. So in many cases, you don't have to do anything. Uh, if in severe cases, you can prune out the damage. And then there are fungicides uh, if they're really affecting your new plantings. And wet root rots, we'll see off-color foliage, mainly on the oldest foliage first. Um, and you'll see entire branches die or entire plants in some cases, um, or sections of plants perhaps. And uh, the roots will be dark and rotted and they'll, they'll strip off easily like we've seen with some of the other images. So these are not healthy roots we wanna see. Uh, nice uh, bright roots um, and and ones that are nice and healthy in structure. Uh, again, it's it's caused by excess soil moisture. Could be from poor drainage, overwatering, planting too deep. A lot of uh, a lot of the same issues when we were talking about azaleas. Management: If you can correct that cultural problem, that's going to be your best. If you can diagnose it early, there are fungicides for you. And let's talk about Southern Magnolia, another staple of our Florida landscapes, uh, Magnolia grandiflora. It has a few insects and a disease that's uh, out there as well. Talk first about the black twig borer. Um, you'll see uh, some dieback of the twigs. Twigs will break off. You'll see entrance holes, uh, as you can see in this image. Um, and oftentimes it's, it, it's rare that you have to do a lot of treatment of this. You can prune out and destroy the infected twigs so that uh, uh, you're getting rid of the next generation. Uh, Magnolia white scale. It's a, a white armored scale, so you won't see the, uh, the sooty mold production with this one. Could be active um, virtually year round on this one. Um, you'll see typically the scales active uh, on the underside, but you'll see that uh, um, they'll be clustered along the midrib, and you know you'll see the yellow spots on the upper sides of the leaves. And uh, again, as I mentioned, adults are present year-round. Eggs and crawlers uh, are visible with hand lens. Um, mature trees we typically don't worry about. Maybe a young tree could be heavy enough. Uh, that uh, you may have to, to do some sort of treatment with. Um, if you can time your contact insecticides for when crawlers are active, you, you'll have your best uh, production from your pesticide and systemic insecticides for you know, severe infestations. Again, mainly on young trees probably. And the disease on Southern Magnolia, we'll talk about algal leaf spot. Uh, causes these silver gray areas. Um, sometimes those areas can get coalesced together and cause little larger areas that may drop out. Um, and oftentimes this is more associated with a, a lack of good air movement. Um, really no fungicides uh, are recommended uh, for algal leaf spot. You'll see this on magnolias. You'll sometimes see it on camellias as well. Let's talk about oaks. 
oaks are, you know, a staple in our landscape, but they're not uh, pest proof. We have some insects, we have diseases, and we have a few other problems that we'll talk about. Uh, first, we'll talk about some bores. There's a lot of bores that can affect plants, typically not affecting vigorous growing trees. It's usually uh, bores that are uh, tend to affect trees that are weakened from some other issue. Um, you can see foliage discoloration, wilting, dieback of branches. If you examine the trunk, you may see uh, small holes in the trunk. You may see uh, some oozing, you may see sawdust, you may see pellets at the base. Um, if you were to peel back some of the bark, you'd, uh, you'd see some of the tunneling that uh, the larvae have uh, done underneath that bark. Um, so again, this is something that's typically not on healthy trees. So what do we do? We manage them, we keep our trees healthy, uh, ideally, make sure we reduce any stresses that are out there. Um, prune out any dead wood, um, any severely infested trees, the, the damage is done. Um, so it's, it's time to uh, destroy that tree uh, and replace it. And then uh, you can do trunk applications of insecticides on nearby trees. So if you've had a, uh, a severely affected tree, um, you may want to protect trees that are adjacent and nearby. A lot of caterpillars can get on oak trees. We see that uh, uh, various times of the year, depending upon the species of caterpillars, you may see complete defoliation from time to time. Um, and oftentimes you may see uh, the pellets of frass underneath staining concrete. And, um, you know, it uh, very common. A lot of different caterpillars. Here you see the Eastern tent caterpillars. They'll uh, form these web-like masses in the trees. Um, they often occur in the springtime is, is where you see many of uh, the caterpillar populations uh, be heaviest. Um, some have one generation per year, others can have multiple, um, and it will vary from year to year as to just um, how bad they can be. Um, Rarely are we going to see enough damage that uh, that would require treatment. Um, usually it's just more of a, a headache than anything. Um, so if there are webworms associated, you can remove and destroy those webs. Um, there are approved insecticides if necessary, but in most cases, we won't need that. Um, let's talk about some galls. Uh, galls are confusing to a lot of people. They uh, a lot of different galls you can have. You can have leaf galls. You can have stem galls. Um, they can vary in color and shapes. Um, and they, they are a response to egg laying or feeding of various insects, wasps, midges, um, mites, and others. Um, you may see small exit holes on the outside of uh, some of the galls. Ideally, um, planting new trees, try and select trees that are gall free as much as possible. Um, don't worry about leaf galls. Leaf galls are, are harmless, but stem galls, if you can prune behind them, um, it, uh, it certainly will help. Twig girdlers. Uh, this is a small beetle. Um, I've got a picture uh, uh, on the next slide, so you'll see it. Um, and it'll actually cause uh, these small limbs to drop out of the trees. It's laid its eggs in those uh, those pieces, and you want to make sure that you pick up any of those dead twigs that uh, that drop off. Um, damage is done during the fall, and you know you, if you don't pick up those, then the next generation is going to um, survive in the in the soil and uh, reinfect the tree next year. So, best thing you can do is collect and destroy those twigs. Normally, an insecticide is not warranted here. Oak leaf blister. Uh, this is a disease causes these wrinkled blisters and distortion, um, mainly in the springtime on newly expanding leaves. Tend to see this one on laurel uh, oaks and uh, maybe on uh, schumard oaks, but you won't see this one on live oak. Uh, but uh, you'll get these these areas that become brown and necrotic. 
Um, and it's usually associated with rainy, wet spring weather. As far as management, uh, typically fungicides aren't needed. Uh, you can rake any fallen leaves to reduce the inoculum that would be around for next year. And root and butt rots. You can have uh, crown dieback. Um, you can have uh, these fungi that uh, show up, um, a lot of leaf drop. Um, so you want to try and, you know, make sure you keep your eyes open for these. Oftentimes you're going to see it associated with damage to the trunk, um, and it'll be worse in areas that have uh, compacted soil, um, just poor overall soil conditions, and, and oftentimes in old age as well. Proper management. Um, you know, ideally, we've got properly planted trees. Um, we avoid wounds to the trunk, so keep those string trimmers uh, from damaging the trunks of our trees and, and lawnmowers and other things that could injure those. Um, protect our trees during construction so that uh, we have uh, good construction barriers placed around trees during construction. Uh, don't allow grade changes to our soil. And then uh, remove the fruiting bodies to reduce the spread. and uh, you may need to replace the soil or fumigate if you're replanting. Tabacchia leaf spot, it's another disease you can uh, sometimes get. It's often associated with you know, heavy amounts of rainfall or in some cases where irrigation is shooting up into a, a young tree. Um, and so here you'll see this again on uh, laurel and schumard oaks. Um, if you can avoid that, that overhead irrigation or that irrigation shooting into that tree, certainly you're gonna, uh, it, it's gonna help things. And fungicides um, are effective, but in most cases not needed. And mistletoe, this is a parasitic plant. Um, we've all seen mistletoe. We usually don't see it until our trees drop their leaves. And then we see these round spheres of, of green that kind of hang out. It is a parasite. It is getting, uh, it's, it's rooted into the, the trunk uh, or stems and it's getting its uh, nutrients and uh, moisture and everything from that tree. So you'll see it a lot on oaks, but you'll also see it on pecan, hickory, other hardwoods. Um, ideally, if you can prune it at least a foot below where it's attached, that's helpful. Uh, where, it, where it can't be pruned out of uh, larger trunks or stems, um, there are some scooping techniques where you can scoop underneath it. Uh, it does do some damage, um, but uh, uh, mistletoe is one we want to control. Oftentimes, it's associated with uh, older, uh, less vigorous growing trees, too. And sosids, or tree cattle. We get lots of questions about these. Uh, you'll see these herds of these small insects moving, oftentimes underneath uh, a webbing that they, they'll... Uh, put on, onto the stem or onto the trunk of the tree, just provides them some protection. Um, they're, they're not doing any damage. There's no reason to worry about control. Um, so it's, it's one of those issues you just uh, learn to ignore. And then you've got Spanish moss. A lot of confusion about Spanish moss. Um, a, a lot of people think that it's, uh, it's killing trees. Um, where we see Spanish moss, uh, heaviest is in less vigorous trees. So if you see uh, a heavy infestation or, or congregation of Spanish moss, a lot of Spanish moss tends to tell me that plant is not vigorously growing. The canopy is opening up, allowing sunlight in for the Spanish moss. Um, the key to do is going to be to figure out what is causing that tree to open its canopy and not be growing vigorously and address that problem. The moss is not the problem, it's whatever the underlying problem with that tree is. So there are, you know, ideally if you have, have to remove some of that moss, um, certainly you can do it mechanically. Not the only problem it really causes, it can block out some light in when it's heavy and it, it can also get quite uh, literally heavy uh, in weight uh, when it gets wet, uh, could cause some limb breakage as well. But it's not taking anything from that tree. It is not a parasite. It's an epiphyte uh, as opposed to a parasite. And our last plant we're going to talk about today is viburnum. 
Uh, we've got uh, viburnum odoratissimum and suspensum are probably some of the most common ones planted. We've got a few insects and one disease we'll talk about. Um, aphids, we've talked a lot about aphids. Uh, again, pear-shaped insects, uh, they'll have the cornicles on them. Um, you can have them really throughout the growing season, but they'll tend to be on the newest growth first, and they'll cause these new leaves to, uh, to be distorted, um, curled. Um, so, you know, look out for our uh, biological controls that are out there, our natural predators. Um, ladybird beetles do a lot. Lacewings can do a lot. So, you know, make sure you're uh, taking care of them. Um, Certainly there's soaps, oils, and other insecticides that are effective against aphids, but monitor, especially when they're putting out new growth. Um, spider mites can be a problem. We've talked a lot about mites today. Again, they'll cause that stippled uh, appearance. Um, and um, the various mites are more common uh, at various um, times of the year, but uh, you'll need to make sure that you uh, any any pesticides or any controls that you're doing, make sure you're uh, taking care of both sides of the leaves because oftentimes they're located on the undersides of the leaves. And thrips. Uh, thrips are ras have a rasping mouth part, and they can really affect um, your viburnums, especially viburnum odoratissimum. And they'll give this kind of uh, bleached appearance to it as they've rasped uh, that, uh, that leaf tissue. Um, in most cases, um, you know, they're, unless uh, it's heavy, we probably don't need to do any, uh, any treatment. Spring will be uh, when it's worst, uh, especially that's when thrips tend to be uh, kind of at their heaviest. The, uh, here you can see one of the, one of the thrips and it's, uh, you know, the adults are going to be tiny, black and elongated. Um, nymphs will be uh, lighter in color. And uh, there are insecticides for uh, severe infested infestations. White flies, we can get white flies on uh, our viburnums as well. It'll cause again, some spotting to the foliage. Um, you may see a lot of sooty mold. Um, adults will kind of fly as you kind of, uh, if you were to manipulate the, the branch a little bit, you'd see the uh, adults fly off. Um, and then they'll come back. So it may take some multiple treatments. Um, and uh, one thing to watch for is uh, look for your uh, predators and see what kind of activity uh, they've had. Some of our parasitic wasps can parasitize those, uh, uh, those pupae and uh, th they'll do a lot of good work for us. Soaps and oils can work. Um, the silver leaf is more difficult to control. And mushroom root rot, we've talked a lot about it. Again, it can affect a wide range of plants. You'll tend to see that white mycelial growth um, underneath the bark at the soil line. So um, that's, uh, that's one to watch for. Again, it's caused, uh, it's taken up by uh, plants that are weakened. So um, we'll remove those uh, diseased plants, ideally replace the soil or fumigate and uh, then we'll uh, put nice, young, vigorous plants in their place. And with that, we've covered a lot of plants. We've covered a lot of pests. It really is helpful to know, you know what to look for. And hopefully this presentation has given you some of those, uh, those clues as to what to watch for on some of our more common plants. Um, and uh, you, know, there's, uh, you can do this investigation with your, on your own with some of your other plants. So as you're, uh, as you're doing your homework and figuring out what plants uh, are the right plant for your uh, Florida-friendly landscape, make sure that uh, you're seeing what potential issues could come with it. That way you can uh, be on the lookout and, and scout for those. So with that, uh, I'll take any questions and uh, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Tom. That was a great presentation. Um, I really learned a lot and thought it was fascinating. Um, we have quite a few questions in the question and answer box. So I'll just, I'll start with those. And um, it is 11.08. Um, so um, we'll just try to be conscientious of time. Great. Uh, um, so the first one, I believe, is when you were um, going through azaleas, and it says, will lifting the plant help it recover? 
you know, if if the damage is caught early enough, lifting the plant and or removing the mulch that has been piled up around it can certainly help. So yes, um, the the key is to to identify that before it becomes too uh, too problematic. So um, you know, you got to catch it as early as possible. But yes, awesome. Um, and then, how to address passion flower caterpillars would be the next question. Okay. Um, question is, do you want those caterpillars or not? Um, you know, it's when we're talking about caterpillars, we're oftentimes we're talking about um, something that could be beneficial to some people, something that some somebody wants to see. So it could be a good bug or it could be a bad bug. Depends on your perspective. Um, you know, certainly if if you're looking to see butterflies around, you may want to uh, encourage them and leave them, uh, let them feed away. Um, but if they, if you're growing it for that particular foliage, um, you know, then, then that may be, uh, maybe something that you need to manage if it's doing a lot of damage. So, um, you know, caterpillars in general can be controlled as, uh, as I mentioned earlier with BT and, and other insecticides, but, you know, if they're not doing a lot of damage and you can encourage them, I would probably let them be. Perfect. Um, the next two questions revolve around um, how to fumigate soil and what would you use to fumigate that soil? Yeah, and you know, fumigants are, are less um, available than they used to be. When I started my career 100 years ago, um, fumigants were available to the homeowner. They no longer are and they're not available for use in uh, a lot of soil situations. Um, you know, so there are some products uh, the professionals can uh, utilize, but uh, that's that's not something that uh, uh, I, to be quite honest, I'm not sure what is currently available and what isn't. And so I would check with your local cooperative extension folks and see um, what is available to you based upon whether you're uh, you've got a commercial license or what that um, site is. Oftentimes they're not not for use in sandy type soils, so. Um, you ha just have to really evaluate the site and uh, the available chemicals to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Tom. Um, the next question that I'm going to read to you is, um, will fungus gnats be addressed today? Um, they're very common here in South Florida and can be in nursery plants and house plants. Are there any advice that you have to controlling these fungus gnats? You know, fungus gnats tend to be associated with uh, too much moisture. So, you know, first thing I, I would think about um, with with fungus gnats is to, if we can, reduce the amount of moisture in the area. Um, if it's a potted plant, like a house plant or something, cut back on your watering. Um, certainly, don't you know, don't cut back so much that your your plant succumbs to drought. Um, but make sure that you're letting that soil surface dry between waterings and um, not continually keeping that soil wet. Um, so that's, you know, that's what we can do in potted type situations. We can also repot those, those plants uh, with uh, a, a well-drained potting media, uh, as opposed to something that, again, that holds excess uh, amounts of moisture. Um, there are, so are some insecticides that uh, are labeled for fungus gnat uh, management, um, you know, but uh, I try and just um, control them by managing the moisture issues. Okay, um, okay let's see. Um, the next question is hibiscus plant care against pests. Hibiscus was one of, that was one of the plants I wasn't going to be able to have time to get to. Um, and <laughs> there's a whole litany of issues with with hibiscus. Um, and they're not all insect or disease problems too. Um, they, you know, they can drop buds and they can uh, drop uh, leaves, you know, just to stress. Uh, and uh, there are certainly a lot of insects, a lot of white flies, um, you know, down in South Florida, you know, that uh, you're, you're dealing with more so than up in uh, this part of town up in uh, North Florida. Um, so, you know, hibiscus are, you know, a, a great tropical plant. They give great color, but uh, there certainly are a lot of issues between aphids, white flies, um, even a lot of cultural issues with just causing stress. Wonderful. Yeah, I think we could do a whole 
year long series on different <laughs> on this topic in different areas and different plants. <laughs> Certainly. Um, the next question is please comment on the use of Epsom salts when, how much, et cetera. Epsom salts um, is, you know, magnesium sulfate. Um, and it depends on the plant that you're putting it on. And, but it is a certainly a source of magnesium. Um, and so, you know, if you have uh, a palm that's there, there's there's good amounts. I'd have to look up the the rates. Um, but uh, some of our fact sheets on Edis um, can uh, provide those rates for you, or your local extension office can give you some of that uh, information as well. Um, but where you have magnesium deficiency, that can be uh, helpful. Uh, but you may also need to address the pH issue um, so that uh, long term you can. Uh, affect uh, the availability of that magnesium. So it's utilize it, but you need to know a little bit. I'd have to know a little bit more about what plants it's on, how big those plants are. Um, and then I'd go to some of the fact sheets. Some of the resources that you have that can help uh, are university websites like EDIS, E-D-I-S. Um, and that's, uh, that's where all the electronic documents are housed. And uh, it can be really helpful um, to... Uh, you know, you'll find fact sheets on most anything you could ever want. And uh, so you can always put uh, in your search bar in Google, you can put IFAS if you'd like, I-F-A-S, um, stands for Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, or you can put EDIS, E-D-I-S, um, and that's uh, where a lot of those documents are going to be um, found. So they'll, hopefully that'll be helpful and you can utilize that to, to, as a great resource for information. Um, I think that's a great way to it, wrap this up. Um, there's been some um, chat in the chat box and um, there's been some people responding to questions that have been great and putting in EDIS documents and things like that. Good. Um, I think this was a fantastic webinar and I really appreciate you taking the time to um, you know, go through all these questions and, and um, we've had people stay on even, you know, after you know 11 o'clock so I think that there's been a lot of interest in this and um, a lot of people saying thank you very much in the chat box well thank you so much it was my pleasure we went through a lot of plants a lot of pests uh, but hopefully you get the concept uh, to uh, do a little research before you plant thank you have a great day